it makes all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. Man, listen, um, I have a interview directly after you with the uh, progressive candidate for Arkansas governor. And okay. um, I am so excited to talk to both of you guys in one day. This is a, this is a big thing for me, man. I feel like I'm coming up in the world. Hey, so am I. I'm talking to you. <laughs> no, I believe the start. Man, we, we've come uh, full circle from like a year ago when I first reached out to you and we talked uh -huh. and, and everything and that's this happened. Is really, and this is really the first time I've ever actually talked to you technically face to face. But yeah, so I'm, so I'm glad that we finally got the chance to do so. Me Especially too, man. Me too. And, and, you know, um, it's crazy how, you know, I came across you as such a pivotal moment. Like I've always, you know, my, my story, my, my family story, um, you know, I did a lot of research a couple of years ago and found out that my great, great grandfather was a slave in North Carolina, you know, mm -hmm. clearly growing up in Arkansas, I knew my dad's history, my grandpa's history and, you know, having two parents that, that came up under Jim Crow, I was always aware of it. Um, but, you know, over the past five years or so, I've really tried to get back involved or get more involved in my culture and the culture of the black community and understand what that means to be like a black foundational American. So when I'm searching through different documentaries and different movies and then I come again uh, across the uh, the alt right uh, video on Netflix, and that was my first introduction to you an introduction to the the phrase antifa and this was maybe even before 2016 when did the alt-right documentary come out it came out in 2018 we shot it for um all of 2017 okay um and that was when everybody first heard the term i mean in fact i always make the point when you hear it pronounced antifa that uh -huh. generally means you heard it for the first time in either 2016 2017 right that's a term that's been um that's been used for a uh, couple of decades now, and um, it's actually pronounced Antifa. Antifa, okay. That's why I say if you hear it called Antifa, I always have to tell people we're not anti-fascists, we're yeah. anti-fascists. So, well, well, yeah. So, and, 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 know, that, and that's important to bring up. It, 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 and, and the reason why I feel I need to correct people is because it helps people, it informs people that there is a misunderstanding as to what our trajectory is going to be in the future and well, where, we, where it is now, as a matter of fact. Well, let's, I want to, I want to delve into that here in a little bit. I, I, I'm a little bit off on my dates here. So I was thinking, yeah, the, the first election of, of Trump was in 2016. So that was probably right. when like the lexicon of, of political activism really came into my peripheral. Like I never really uh -huh. even thought about that. I heard a lot about the, the Occupy movement back in the late Obama years, but you know, once Trump got elected, you started to see more people galvanizing on both sides of this. So um, that for, for me, that was an interesting um, kind of, kind of entrance into hearing that phrase for the first time. But, and this is where it all comes full circle. You know, I moved from the Midwest. I moved from Missouri in July of 2020 and I moved to Portland. And so when I came to Portland and started working in armed security, this whole area was just inundated with Antifa. And it was like a part of the norm here. And it's something that I, I witnessed from a distance uh, working for news organizations throughout the whole George Floyd protest. Mm -hmm. um, something that I witnessed at a distance. And so it's been kind of at the forefront of my existence here in Portland. And my reaching out to you is to try and get a better understanding from someone who's involved in it as to what it is, what the purpose of it is, and where you see it going in the future. Because this channel is specifically set up for security guards. Um, and most people wouldn't think, but here in Portland, if you're working security in retail establishments, you're working security in banks, or if you're working like myself uh, in the middle of that, that protest area, you're going to have interaction uh, with this group. And I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about the group pro and con. And I'm just the kind of person to where if I don't know something, I try to seek out information. So this is clearly an opportunity for me just to kind of get some some understanding from your perspective of what's going on. Okay. Hey, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide that understanding. 
I've already awesome. got a few things that I want to say as it is. So awesome. All right. Well, let me go ahead and do my intro. Um, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in today. This is the Observe and Report podcast here on the Security Guard channel. Today, we are honored to have a, I'd like to call him a friend. I met this guy about a year ago under some very sketchy circumstances, somebody that I was dealing with that I think that I might have been not understanding who I was talking to and dealing with. But Mr. Daryl Lamont Jenkins, uh, DLJ, how are you, sir? What's up? I guess you can say we're friends. <laughs> Excellent. Good. There, there is no, there, there is no um, gray area there. We cool. <laughs> Outstanding. Outstanding. I, I appreciate that. And I think that, you know, we're in a political climate right now where everybody is kind of galvanized and they've, they've dug into their sides. And I think that you will be very transparent and honest with my watchers and listeners here that there have been times that I've posted things that I am, I am no fan of Antifa in terms of some of the things that I have observed here from my perspective. Um, I respect you as a journalist. I respect you as an activist. But aside from that, I respect you as a man. And so that's partly why I reached out to you, because you are the uh, foremost uh, knowledgeable person about this movement. And so with my questions, I wanted to come right to the source. So really quickly, if you can just give everybody a quick introduction as to who you are and, and, and what you're about, that'd be great. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for having me. For, thank you for having me on the show. Um, I, and uh, I'll just get right to it. My name is Daryl Lamont Jenkins. I am the uh, founder and executive director of an Antifa organization called One People's Project. Now, I'm saying Antifa for, for the sake of the show, but ultimately, we are a anti-hate organization. We basically try to um, monitor, research, and report on right-wing groups and individuals and basically encourage communities to be proactive against those elements because we feel that they are a danger to society as we go forward. We are a society that wants to evolve. We want to, we are a society that grows and builds and we cannot do that every time there's a boot on somebody's neck. And that's what we see conservatism as being that particular, that proverbial boot. And we have seen it more often than not, whether you're talking about them being the um, practitioners of racism or sexism or, um, homophobia or Islamophobia or what have you, it always comes from not just that particular element, but from particular people within that element. So we start, obviously we're recognizing a pattern and we say, this cannot stand. People need to know who is who and what is what so that we can protect ourselves as we do in fact go forward. And one of the people's project has been around since 2000. Um, and, and basically I'm a journalist by vocation and we simply report on, um, those individuals and those groups who are out there doing things. Um, they are now calling me the father of doxing in some media publications. And that is because back in the day, around, you know, 2000, 2001, uh, we was basically responding to how anti-abortion activists were being allowed to publish names and addresses on their on their websites, crossing them out of those um, if those persons were killed or, or just died. And uh, <clears throat> and the course had said it was OK for them to do that. And we said, OK, fine. It's OK for us to do it. And we never looked at it as a weapon. We looked at it as just furthering our reporting. And we and we still do to this day. Well, Daryl, you said that you said that you started out as a journalist. What was your background before getting involved with the One People's Project? Were you working for a news organization? Were you working for a different publication? I was with the Korean News. I was with the um, back in the day. I was a columnist for the Korean News. I actually started off as a commie as a communist. Listen to me. Oh, oh they're going to use that. Fine. I have you been never, you're never day. living that down. <laughs> oh, who cares? <laughs> Hey, hey, been there, done that. So yeah, yeah. I was a might as well call me a communist for the Courier News, but no, I was a columnist for yeah. the Courier News, and um, that's a local newspaper here in New Jersey. And um, I actually that's how I started off as being opinionated. Yeah, and it, it, it branched off to me actually being a reporter for even smaller newspapers and for my um. Um, for my black newspaper, the city newspaper, the local uh, 
um, weekly newspaper. It doesn't exist anymore. But uh, but eventually I realized I couldn't be a reporter per se because I was not as objectionable as I should be. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was very subjective. So <laughs> so um, I meant to say objective, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but. The fact of the matter is I had to I had to be able to create a forum, create some sort of platform where I can explain exactly why it is I take the stances that I do, why it is I believe as I do. And do that without getting caught up in propaganda, getting caught up um, with rhetoric and everything, because you do that. It's short on facts, very short on facts. And I'm a fact based guy. So I had to make sure that if I was going to go out there and tell people what I was about and why I was about it, I had to be able to make my case effectively. So One People's Project came about with that mission in mind. We just do not get caught up in all the rah-rah of um, political campaigning, and so, so to speak, and just reported. And yeah. literally, we reported and you decided <laughs> to coin a phrase. Yeah. Well, so for for anyone that is watching this that is unaware or maybe has preconceived notions of the organization of Antifa. So just give us from your perspective, what is Antifa or Antifa? Antifa is short for anti-fascism. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. It was it was anti-fascist that won World War II. Whether you are talking about those American soldiers, American, oh, soldiers, allied soldiers, I should say, um, from from the U.S., the U.K., Canada, um, fighting Germany and Italy, or those partisans in Italy that were fighting against Mussolini. But it was something that was going on since 1927, anti-fascism. Ever since Mussolini coined the phrase fascism, we, um, there was a, there were anti-fascists and they were fighting them. And that's how long anti-fascism has been around. It's just in, I would say, within the past 30, 40 years, you started hearing the term Antifa. Just to, just to shorten it up. Just to shorten it up. I mean, our website's, um, our website's email address, my organization's email address is antifa at onepeoplesproject.com, and we've had it for about 20 years. Okay. You know? So it's not a new term. And, and I always try to tell people with that in mind, if you are against fascism, you are Antifa, you are anti-fascist. And you have to go through history to take a look at who that, who that means exactly. You look at Martin Luther King, you look at Ida B. Wells for whom our, um, our newsline idavox.com is named after. You look at Sojourner Truth, you look at Harriet Tubman, um, you look at Cesar Chavez or, or I mean, like I said before, those who have fought in World War II, they were Antifa. They were Antifa. And you are Antifa as well, if you are believing or you are about those individuals from history. So um, what we are doing right now in this day and age is dealing with the fact that people have just heard that term in the past four years. And because there isn't a lot of people from the anti-fascist side that are public, um, that do go on podcasts and programs such as this, um, there's a void that enemies, people who are in fact fascists, um, found themselves able to fill. And, yeah. you know, it's been mostly over the past four years, it's basically us swatting back the misconceptions, swatting back the lies that come out, especially when you're looking at some of the shenanigans that the right pulls in order to advance their narrative about Antifa, where they was where they will create some guy that said he used to be an Antifa and now he is um warning everybody against it with his new book Antifa behind the mask or some nonsense there is yeah. something like that or you have an well, ending or you have well, let me let me let me oh, ask you about this. i've been talking for a while no that's okay <laughs> and i i appreciate you you having such a dialogue with that because like i said 
you're the authority on this. My question mm -hmm. to you is this though, do you worry that by having a, an ideal and the ideal that you're speaking of is to be against fascism, which I think that any sane person would say that I don't support fascism. I don't think that most people would ever admit to supporting fascism, right? But with having just an ideal that it allows for that ideal to be corrupted, you know, Gavin McGinnis talks about the Proud Boys in the exact same way that you're talking about Antifa. So you're saying that you are working towards a, an ideal that is for the betterment of society. And Gavin McGinnis, when he talks about the Proud Boys, he talks about, hey, I'm just starting a drinking club. It's just a men's club. It's yeah. all about humor. And yeah. if, you, if you look at his, um, his explanation of the progression of the Proud Boys and where it is today, that that has nothing to do with his original vision. Now, we could debate that, and I could post videos that would speak to the contrary. I'm sure you could, too. But do you worry that your position in Antifa and how you view it might not truly be how the people that are involved in it in different levels are viewing it. Do you ever feel that that message is being lost and that it's getting corrupted by people that maybe have different intentions? I think this is all the more reason why it's more important to produce results than it is to produce optics. Antifa has never really been about the optics. It's about trying to get things done. When you're talking about Antifa as a movement, as, as those that are out out there trying to um, make things happen. It has been about producing results. Now, whether or not you're down with some of the results and some of the things you've seen out there, that's one thing. But if you are, it's just like with Black Lives Matter. You can you believe that Black Lives Matter, um, but you may have issues with certain ways that a Black Lives Matter has approached the um, concerns of police brutality and police violence. Now, I don't have such concerns. Let me just preface this. Let me just preface this right now. Um, but folks do. But you still believe as you do. So, and, and I will say that with Antifa as well. Um, I think basically when I, some, one of the things that I always try to tell people, and you see it, hear me say it from time to time, if you don't like what's, um, if you think that the way that things are going is wrong, you go out there and do what's right. It is going to depend on you to make sure that the ship is going in the right direction if you do not feel that the ship is going in the right direction. Now, now as far as I'm concerned, a lot of um, what um, we have seen over the past four years, whether you're talking about, when you're talking about Antifa versus the Proud Boys, have revealed itself to be what they are eventually. Because anti-fascism is a good thing, and fascism that the Proud Boys are about are a bad thing. We have seen we have seen what come came out of it, what comes out of all of that. We don't see Antifa going to jail the way the Proud Boys are going to jail. We don't see Antifa storming the Capitol because um, we would get ourselves killed if we did. We see yeah. the Proud Boys storming the Capitol, but then again, Donald Trump and his people were in the Capitol. And it remains to be seen whether or not um, whether or not there was something a little bit more nefarious that was going on that day. Oh, no, I, you I know, you bring up a you you bring up a very valid point. And you bring up a very good point. And I want to kind of dive into that. the 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 thought process amongst most progressive and most people who are on the left, and if you just were to take at face value some of the Department of Justice reports that came out in 2016 under the Trump administration is that white nationalism and white supremacists have infiltrated the uh, GOP, the Republican Party, right? So mm -hmm. if you subscribe to that and you believe that, is it also safe to say that Antifa has infiltrated the Democrat Party? Would you say that that's also true? I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about if you're anti-fascist, um, you're anti-fascist. I mean, there are anti-fascist Democrats. I don't think it's an infiltration. I think it's just what it is. If you do, if you are a progressive, you're anti-fascist. You know. So, but do you see any danger? But, in in, but, to, but, but, but do you see any danger with people? 
identifying with either of these these labels. And you know, I feel like no, the biggest issue not. that I do you, not. You don't that well, well, in regards to identifying with anti fascist anti fascism or anti no, I do not. I absolutely do not. I do not see any danger in that. And I'll tell you something else, because ultimately it's a straw man. It's a straw man that the right puts up that says Antifa is a bad thing. I always try to tell people they want to try to criminalize Antifa. They want to try to criminalize Black Lives Matter. They want to continue to call them organizations um, because they don't want to be seen as thought police. They basically want to tell you that it should be illegal to be anti-fascist and believe that Black Lives Matter. That's how you got to look at it. Now, in regards to the optics, as I said, that we should eschew, <laughs> um, if you're concerned about that, if you're concerned about um, the things that have happened, um, the more aggressive things that have happened over the past um, year or so, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I can understand that. We have to work. We have to figure out what to do as we go forward in regards to that. Um, but it is not the totality of Antifa. It's not the totality of anti-fascism. Now, if you take what now, let's. Tr- go back to what the Proud Boys are about. They are a danger to society. Fascism is a danger. It has been shown to be a danger to society. And in regards to um, the fact that they say that um, Republicanism, Republicans are infiltrated by um, white supremacy, uh, by white supremacists, they've always been there. And when you go back and when you look at people like Pat Buchanan, he's been a Republican. He was a Republican. It's conservatism, honestly, when you talk about um, uh, when you talk about the Republicans, that is that is the um, that is the threat to that party going forward, because as far as I'm concerned, conservatism is shallow. Well, let me let um, me interject something here. So when you when you talk about how fascism is the biggest threat, Mm -hmm. and I think that when you talk about a a global or you talk about a societal um, view fascism in and of itself is a big threat. But I want to ask you a question specifically concerning you and I. You and I are clearly black men, right? Yeah. And one of the things that that I noticed over the past year working in the protest here in Portland, 99.9% of the Antifa movement and the Black Lives Matter movement were all white teenagers and white young adults. And so Everything that transpired in Portland over the past year, the damage done downtown, which has been extensive, it's been horrible, what it's done to the economy in this area and the message that it sends. So you have, you know, from May of 2020 all the way through the election, every single night, continuous damage, fires, rioting, uh, spray painting, that's all being done downtown, downtown in the name of Antifa and Black Lives Matter. And that's being broadcast across the country every single year. And to me, I couldn't help but but feel that the message of what happened to George Floyd and how the nation was galvanized behind this push for a change and, 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 and policing here in this country and the push for accountability for police brutality, that that message was corrupted by what was happening here in Portland under the guise of of Antifa. As a black man, have you ever felt that you might have been selling our community short by siding with something that has been so corrupted in terms of how it's viewed across the country? And I say that with all due respect. No, I know you do. I mean, but I'll tell you, no, not really, because I think we came here first. I mean, when you talk about... um, before there was Black Lives Matter, before um, we saw what we see in Portland, there was L.A., there was Florida. There was some action going on in Florida back in the early 80s. There was Ferguson. There was Baltimore. We flared out. We flared up ourselves. I mean, it comes with the frustrations when it comes to us. It comes with the frustrations. Um, we are seeing our black men and women and children dying at the hands of people who are supposed to be protecting us. They're being taught by people like Dave Grossman not to care about um, about who you kill. You so know? for anybody who is unaware, Dave oh, Grossman. Yeah, yeah, is we better a, explain that one. <laughs> I, I think that Dave Grossman is a former Green Beret. 
And he has a program that many municipal police departments employ, and it's called Killology. And Killology, basically, in a nutshell, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's to train officers to turn off the empathetic and sympathetic switch and react and respond quickly and aggressively to neutralize the threat. And I'm saying this in a very, um, in a much more, I, I, I'm not sure what the word is I want to say here, but I'm saying this in a much more um, sanitized version than what Dave would say himself. I've actually looked into Killology and on the surface of what the program is, I, I understand where that's coming from. I do think that you have to have a more nuanced conversation about how that's employed and who that's employed against. And, you know, this goes back to the totality of this conversation that we're having. I have wanted to talk to you for so long. And I thought to myself, is this something that I want to put on this channel? Because clearly the people that are focusing on my channel are either law enforcement or somewhat pro law enforcement, pro second amendment. And I subscribe to all of that, but I also subscribe to the fact that this is a conversation that needs to be had. And I don't see people who are moderate left, moderate right, having conversations with people who are on the far left or the far right, where this dialogue can be had. And, and listen, the things that you're saying, I don't agree with all of them, but I appreciate the fact that we're able to have this conversation because what I'm going to do is take this information and I'm going to think about it. And when I think about it, I'll come back with a different set of questions. But, you know, <laughs> well, I'd be more than happy to come back from time to time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know we're short on time, um, but I should point out something about my history. I served in the military um, and I served in the military as a police officer. Um, I was and I have to preface, I have to add a disclaimer here uh, and say that I did not have the most exemplary service. I did not last long. Um, but it wasn't due to any kind of um, political inclinations. I just sucked as a soldier, really. Ultimately, I had just have to accept that and I have to live with that. Um, it wasn't the direction that I wanted to go in because I, you know, I was just too much of an individual. Um, but I did not appreciate. But what I didn't appreciate that I do now was the fact that I was there and I still should have been a better soldier while I was there and just handled things after I left. So, yeah. like I said, I got to live with that. But I was in that world. I was in that world. And I do understand exactly what it is that when you're talking about security, when you're talking about protecting um, your communities or whatever it is you might be protecting, um, you have to have um, some sort of focus, I guess is the word, um, in order to do that, do that job effectively. And Daryl, what do you what do you say to someone like me who mm -hmm. spent five months every night for five months literally watching people destroy my city mm -hmm. and they're doing this under the flag that you have behind you either one of them yeah. right i'm a black man and 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 i am literally the people that they are saying that they are doing this in support of yet my job is i'm not law enforcement but I'm, I'm, I'm basically serving in that capacity, right? right? What do you say to someone like me who is watching that situation transpire and I'm having this, this frustration in, this, in this, this anger towards what I'm seeing? Because not only am I a black man who, who is watching this, I'm also a taxpayer. I'm also a veteran. You know, I'm also, I have, I have law enforcement experience. Like I get the the issue and i get the the frustration and that's, and that's the important thing like i said earlier if you see what the what pe if you feel what people are doing is not the right direction to go and you have to be the one that takes the bull by the horn you can basically say i mean and you can say okay they're what they're doing is wrong it does if you feel that it makes people look bad i can uh, look i can appreciate that um i may disagree but I can appreciate that. But by the same token, you also are in the position to put it in a direction that you feel might be best, that they might be receptive to, that they will be receptive to, believe it or not, because ultimately those that are out in the street 
don't really want to be out in the street like that. We do have the tools in today's society to resolve situations without it having to go that way. One of the biggest things about security, the most important fact, things in security is the ability to de-escalate. You have to de-escalate. I have friends of mine back in the day that were guardian angels. And that's the first and foremost thing that they will talk about. I mean, I'm not a fan of, I'm not a fan of uh, Curtis Lee or anything like that, but by the same token, I was a fan of my friends who weren't necessarily all about law enforcement and everything, but they were about trying to just make sure that their communities are safe. Yeah. And the best way to keep your community is safe is to make sure that there isn't anything um, to be safe against. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure goes a long way when you're talking about security. Make sure that everything's, um, make sure you're prepared to fight back. But we're in a situation right now. We're sitting here able to talk, you and I. Yeah, of we course. Can have, we can have this same, the fact that we can have this discussion means that things are calm enough where we can still have the discussion with the folks that you saw on the street. You don't have to criticize. You don't have to condemn. You just have to say, okay, so how do we build a united front against the elements that we are fighting against? Well, that's that a great way for us. Everyone, and, and there are solutions, as I said, we have the tools. We just have the wrong people in position. Well, that's a great way for us to, to wrap this up. I want to have you in 10 seconds or less. Just give me your thoughts on what it would take for us to get past the point where we are right now post the 2020 election as someone who is convicted um, in your position and what you believe in talking to someone who is more moderate and is receptive to hearing where you're coming from what is the takeaway that those people who are watching this channel today and watching this dialogue between the two of us what is the takeaway that we should have in terms of what we can all do in order to make a better country for for everyone going forward and i know that's a that's a tall task but no it's not oh you can no, articulate it this is what we do all of us are in the position to be uh, all of us are in the position to um right this ship before it sinks um all we have to do is just be mindful of what is going on out there um criticize criticize what you see um within our elected officials and with our our, our hierarchy of government or wherever you at if you see something wrong, say that it's wrong. Be um, be active against those wrong things, and we will go a long way with your involvement, with your activity. You got you got to advocate. You got to advocate, and you'll be able to see a lot of change. You'll see those changes when you see people attacking Black history. When you see people trying to stay for voting rights. When you see people trying to stop the rights of peaceful protesters by saying it's okay to drive into a car, drive a car into protesters, then you have to say something. You have to stop those people who are going to do that. And we don't have to do it by blowing things up. We can do it by voting things out. <laughs> Daryl Lamont Jenkins, I truly appreciate your time. Thank you so much for blessing my podcast with your, your thoughts and your, and your dialogue. And man, listen, I hope to uh, have many, many more conversations with you uh and 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 press you on more issues but I'll man, you are a you are a a worthy advocate my man and i tell you that i respect you i respect what you're doing like i said i don't always agree with you but i i do respect everything that you're doing out there so regardless of whether or not we agree or disagree you know that ultimately no one no one here is trying to do harm absolutely if there's mistakes being made that's one thing but if you're just if you're nefarious, it that's another. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. All Ladies right, and gentlemen, Daryl Lamont Jenkins. All right, thank you, sir. Take care.